you know, it's fun. End of day Brie, because end of day Brie has just finished a full day of work and is tired. But end of day Brie and beginning of day Brie have two different voices. <laughs> so I am going to do... I didn't get any podcasts recorded yesterday, so I am going to get some done today. This is going to have started over. should be on chapter three, I think. Chapter two I did earlier today. Emma, volume two, chapter three. Boop, 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 bite at a time, bite at a time. Emma, chapter, yep, volume two, chapter three. Okay. There it is. Anyways, I've been recording all day. I actually finished recording a book today, so I had to finish editing it once I get done with these guys. Mm -hmm. That's hot. Okay. Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Brie Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. It's like you. All of the links for our show are in the show notes. Today, we will be continuing Emma by Jane Austen. Austen. Chapter 3. Emma could not forgive her, but as neither provocation nor resentment were discerned by Mr. Knightley. Mr. Knightley. Who had been of the party and had seen only proper attention and pleasing behavior on each side. Each side. He was expressing the next morning, being at Hartfield again on business with Mr. Woodhouse, his approbation of the whole. Of the whole. Not so openly as he might have done had her father been out of the room, but speaking plain enough to be very intelligible to Emma. Good to Emma. He had been used to think her unjust to Jane. And. Uh, to Emma. He had been used to think her unjust to Jane and had now great pleasure in marking an improvement. Improvement. A very pleasant evening, he began, as soon as Mr. Woodhouse had been talked into what was necessary. Necessary. Told that he understood and the paper swept away. Swept away. Particularly pleasant. You and Miss Fairfax gave us some very good music. Good music. I do not know a more luxurious state, sir, than sitting at one's ease to be entertained a whole evening by two such young women. Young women. Sometimes with music and sometimes with conversation. Conversation. I am sure Miss Fairfax must have found the evening pleasant, Emma. Pleasant, Emma. You left nothing undone. Nothing undone. I was glad you made her play so much, for having no instrument at her grandmother's, it must have been a real indulgence. Indulgence. I'm happy you approved, said Emma, smiling, but I hope I am not often deficient in what is due to guests at Hartfield. Hartfield? No, my dear, said her father instantly. That I am sure you are not. You are not? There is nobody half so attentive and civil as you are. If anything, you are too attentive. Too attentive. The muffin last night, if it had been handed round once, I think it would have been enough. Been enough? No, said Mr. Knightley, nearly at the same time, you are not often deficit, not often deficit, deficient. That word is deficient. It's been enough. No, said Mr. Knightley, nearly at the same time, you are not often deficient, not often deficient either in manner or comprehension. I think you understand me, therefore. Therefore. An arch look expressed. I understand you well enough, but she said only... Miss Fairfax is reserved. Is reserved. I always told you she was, a little, but you would soon overcome all that part of her reserve which ought to be overcome, all that has its foundation in diffidence. Diffidence. What arises from discretion must be honored. Be honored. You think her diffident. I do not see it. Do not see it. My dear Emma, said he, moving from his chair into one close by her. You are not going to tell me, I hope, that you had not a pleasant evening. Pleasant evening. Oh, no. I was pleased with my own perseverance in asking questions and amused to think how little information I obtained. I obtained. I am disappointed, was his only answer. Only answer. I hope everybody had a pleasant evening, said Mr. Woodhouse in his quiet way. Quiet way. I had, 
Once I felt the fire rather too much, but then I moved back my chair a little, a very little, and it did not disturb me. Disturb me. Miss Bates was very chatty and good-humored as she always is, though she speaks rather too quick. Too quick. However, she is very agreeable, and Miss Bates too, Mrs. Too quick. However, she is very agreeable, and Mrs. Bates too in a different way. Different way. I like old friends, and Miss Jane Fairfax is a very pretty sort of young lady. A very pretty and very well-behaved young lady indeed. Pretty indeed. She must have found the evening agreeable, Mr. Knightley, because she had Emma. I must tear it correctly. <laughs> she had Emma. True, sir, and Emma because she had Miss Fair. Huh? She had Emma. True, sir, and Emma because she had Miss Fairfax. Fairfax. Emma saw his anxiety, and wishing to appease it, at least for the present, said, and with a sincerity which no one could question. Could question. She is a sort of elegant creature that one cannot keep one's eye from. I am always watching her to admire, and I do pity her from my heart. My heart. Mr. Knightley looked as if he were more gratified than he cared to express. And before he could make any reply, Mr. Woodhouse, whose thoughts were on the Bates, said, Bates said, it is a great pity that their circumstances should be so confined. So confined. A great pity indeed. And I have often wished, but it is so little one can venture to do, small trifling presents of anything uncommon. Uncommon. Now we have killed a porker, and Emma thinks of sending them a loin or a leg, and it is very small and delicate. And delicate. Hard-filled pork is not like any other pork. But still it is pork, and my dear Emma, unless one could be sure of their making it into steaks, Nicely fried as ours is fried. Ours is fried. Without the smallest grease and not... Mm. Ours is fried. Without the smallest grease and not roast it. For no stomach can bear roast pork. I think we had better send the leg. Do you think so, my dear? Ours is fried. Uh, ours is fried. Without the small grease. Smallest. Ours is fried. Without the smallest grease, and not roast it, for no stomach can bear roast pork. I think we had better send the leg. Do you not think so, my dear? So, my dear? My dear Papa, I sent the whole hind quarter. I knew you would wish it. You would wish it. There will be the leg to be salted, you know, which is so very nice, and the loin to be dressed directly in any manner they like. Are they like? That's right, my dear. Very right. I had not thought of it before, but that is the best way. The best way. They must not oversalt the leg. And then, it is... The best way. They must not oversalt the leg. And then, if it is not oversalted, and if it is very thoroughly boiled, just as Cyril boils ours, and eaten very moderately of, with a boiled turnip and a little carrot or parsnip, I do not consider it unwholesome. Unwholesome. Emma, said Mr. Knightley presently, I have a piece of news for you. News for you. You like news, and I heard an article in my way hither that I think will interest you. Interest you. News? Oh, yes, I always like news. What is it? What do you smile? Why? What is it? Why do you smile so? Where did you hear it? At Randall's? He had time only to say only to say. No, not at Randall's. I have not been near Randall's. When the door was thrown open and Miss Bates and Miss Fairfax walked into the room. Into the room. Full of thanks and full of news, Miss Bates knew not which to give quickest. Give quickest. Mr. Knightley soon saw that he had lost his moment and that not another syllable of communication could rest with him. Rest with him. Oh, my dear sir, how are you this morning? My dear Miss Woodhouse, I come quite overpowered overpowered. Such a beautiful hind quarter of pork. You are too bountiful. Have you heard the news? Mr. Elton is going to be married. To be married. Emma had not had time even to think of Mr. Elton, and she was so completely surprised that she could not afford a little start and a little blush at the sound. The sound. There is my news. I thought it would interest you, said Mr. Knightley, with a smile which implied a conviction of some part of what had passed between them. Um, there's a hair on my mic. Between them. But where could you hear it? cried Miss Bates. 
Where could you possibly hear it, Mr. Knightley? Mr. Knightley? For it is not five minutes since I received Mrs. Cole's note. No, it cannot be more than five, or at least ten, for I had got my bonnet and Spencer on just ready to come out. To come out? I was only gone down to speak to Patty again about the pork. Jane was standing in the passage. Were you not, Jane? Were you not, Jane? For my mother was so afraid that we had not... Mm. Were you not, Jane? For my mother was so afraid that we had not any salting pan large enough. And large enough. So I said I would go down and see. And Jane said, Shall I go down instead? For I think you have a little cold, and Patty has been washing the kitchen. Washing the kitchen. Oh, my dear, said I. Well, and just then came the note. A Miss Hawkins, that's all I know. That's all I know. A Miss Hawkins of Bath. But, Mr. Knightley, how could you possibly have heard it? For the very moment Mr. Cole told Mrs. Cole of it, she sat down and wrote to me. A Miss Hawkins. Miss Hawkins. I was Miss... Bleh. Hawkins. I was with Mr. Cole on business an hour and a half ago. He had just read Elton's letter as I was shown it and handed it to me directly. Ah. Hawkins. I was with Mr. Cole on business an hour and a half ago. He had just read Elton's letter as I was shown in and handed it to me directly. Me directly. Well, that is quite. I suppose there never was a piece of news more generally interesting. Interesting. My dear sir, you really are too bountiful. My mother desires her very best compliments and regards and a thousand thanks and says you really quite oppress her. Oppress her. We consider it our heart-filled pork, replied Mr. Woodhouse. Oppress her. We consider it our heart-filled pork, replied Mr. Woodhouse. Indeed, it certainly is so very superior to all other pork that Emma and I cannot have a greater pleasure than... A pleasure than... Oh, my dear sir, as my mother says, our friends are only too good to us. If ever there were people who, without having great wealth themselves, had everything they could wish for. Could wish for. I am sure it is us. We may well say that our lot is cast in a goodly heritage. Well, Mr. Knightley, and so you actually saw the letter. Well. Well. It was short. Merely to announce, but cheerful, exulting, of course. And of course. Here was a sly glance at Emma. He had been so fortunate as to... I forget the precise words. One has no business to remember them. To remember them. The information was, as you state, that he was going to be married to a Miss Hawkins. By his style, I should imagine it just settled. This is hair. This is it. Nope. Is it on my face? I don't know. There's something. I think that's what it is. I think it's on my bangs. There we go. Settled. Mr. Elton going to be married, said Emma as soon as she could speak. He will have everybody's wishes for his happiness. His happiness. He is very young to settle, was Mr. Woodhouse's observation. He had better not be in a hurry. He seemed to me very well off as he was. We were always glad to see him at Hartfield. At Hartfield. A new neighbor for us all, Miss Woodhouse, said Miss Bates joyfully. It's joyfully. My mother is so pleased. She says she cannot bear to have the poor old vicarage without a mistress. A mistress. This is great news indeed, Jane. You have never seen... A mistress. This is great news indeed. Jane, you have never seen Mr. Elton. No wonder that you have such a curiosity to see him. To see him. Jane's curiosity did not appear of that absorbing nature as wholly to occupy her. Occupy her. No, I have never seen Mr. Alton, she replied, starting on this appeal. Is he... is he a tall man? Tall man? Who shall answer that question, cried Emma. My father would say yes. Mr. Knightley, no, and Miss Bates and I that he is just the happy medium. Happy medium. When you have been here a little longer, Miss Fairfax, you will understand that Mr. Alton is the standard of perfection in Highbury, both in person and mind. <laughs> That's still hot. And mind. Very true, Miss Woodhouse, so she will. He is the very best young man, but my dear Jane, if you remember I told you yesterday, he was precisely the height of Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry. Miss Hawkins, I dare say, an excellent young woman. Excellent young woman. His extreme attention to my mother. Wanting her to sit in the Vicarage pew that she might hear the better, for my mother is a little deaf, you know. It is not much, but she does not hear quite quick. Quite quick. 
Jane says that Colonel Campbell is a little deaf. It's a little deaf. He fancied bathing might be good for it. The warm bath, but she says it did him no lasting benefit. Lasting benefit. Colonel Campbell, you know, is quite our angel. Quite our angel. And Mr. Dixon seems a very charming young man. Quite worthy of him. Worthy of him. It is such a happiness when good people get together, and they always do. Always do. Now here will be Mr. Elton and Miss Hawkins. And there are the Coles, such very good people. And the Perrys, I suppose there never was a happier or better couple than Mr. and Mrs. Perry. Mrs. Perry. I say, sir, turning to Mr. Woodhouse, I think there are few places with such society as Highbury. As Highbury. I always say we are quite blessed in our neighbors. My dear sir, if there is one thing my mother loves better than another, it is pork. A roast loin of pork. Loin of pork. As to who or what Miss Hawkins is, or how long he has been acquainted with her, said Emma. Her, said Emma. Nothing, I suppose, can be known. One feels that it cannot be a very long acquaintance. He has been gone only four weeks. Four weeks. Nobody had an... Four weeks. Nobody had any information to give. And after a few more wonderings, Emma said, uh, Emma said, You are silent, Miss Fairfax, but I hope you mean to take an interest in this news. In this news. You who have been hearing and seeing so much of late on these subjects, who must have been so deep in the business on Miss Campbell's account. We shall not excuse your being indifferent about Mr. Elton and Miss Hawkins. Miss Hawkins. When I have seen Mr. Elton, replied Jane, I dare say I shall be interested. But I believe it requires that with me. That with me. And as it is some months since Miss Campbell married, the impression may be a little worn off. Excuse me for that burp earlier. Worn off. Yes, he has been gone just four weeks, as you observed, Miss Woodhouse, said Miss Bates. Four weeks yesterday. It's yesterday. A uh, Miss Hawkins. Well, I had always rather fancied it would be some... Yeah, blah, blah, blah. It's yesterday. A uh, Miss Hawkins. Well, I had always rather fancied it would be some young lady hereabouts. Not that I ever. Mrs. Cole once whispered to me, but I immediately said, No, Mr. Elton is a most worthy young man. The young man. But, in short, I do not think I am particularly quick at those sort of discoveries. Discoveries. I do not pretend to it. What is before me, I see. Before me, I see. At the same time, nobody could wonder if Mr. Elton should have aspired. Miss Woodhouse lets me chatter on so good-humouredly. Good-humouredly. She knows I would not offend for the world. How does Miss Smith do? She seems quite recovered now. Recovered now? Have you heard from Mrs. John Knightley lately? Oh, those dear little children. Jane, do you know I always fancy Mr. Dixon like Mr. John Knightley? Mr. John Knightley? I mean in person. Tall and with that sort of look and not very talkative. Very talkative. Quite wrong, my dear aunt. There is no likeness at all. Likeness at all. Very odd, but one never does form a just idea of anybody beforehand. One takes up a notion and runs away with it. Mr. Dixon, you say, is not strictly speaking handsome? 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 Oh, no, far from it. Certainly plain. I told you he was plain. He was plain. My dear, you said that Miss Campbell would not allow him to be plain and that you yourself... <sighs> yourself. Oh, as for me, my judgment is worth nothing. Where I have a regard, I always think a person well looking. Well looking. But I gave what I believed the general opinion when I called him plain. Him plain. Well, my dear Jane, I believe we must be running away. Be running away. The weather does not look well, and Grandmama will be uneasy. Be uneasy. You are too obliging, my dear Miss Woodhouse, but we really must take leave. This has been a most agreeable piece of news indeed. News indeed. I shall just go round by Mrs. Cole's, but I shall not stop three minutes. And Jane, you had better go home directly. I would not have you out in a shower. In a shower. We think she is the better for Highbury already. Thank you. We do indeed. I shall not attempt calling on Mrs. Goddard, for I really do not think she cares for anything but boiled pork. Boiled pork. When we dress the leg, it will be another thing. Good morning to you, my dear sir. Oh, Mr. Knightley is coming too. He's coming too. Well, that is so very... I am sure if Jane is tired, you will be so kind as to give her your arm. For your arm. Mr. Elton and Miss Hawkins, good morning to you. Good morning.
happened to you? Emma, alone with her father, had half her attention wanted by him while he lamented that young people would be in such a hurry to marry. Free to marry. And to marry strangers, too. And the other half she could give to her own view of the subject. The subject. It was to herself an amusing and a very welcome piece of news as proving that Mr. Elton could not have suffered long. Suffered long. But she was sorry for Harriet. Harriet must feel it, and all that she could hope was, by giving the first information herself, to save her from hearing it abruptly from others. Others. It was now about the time that she was likely to call. Free to call. If she were to meet Miss Bates in her way. And upon its beginning to rain, Emma was obliged to expect that the weather would be detaining her at Mrs. Goddard's. Mrs. Goddard's. And that the intelligence would undoubtedly rush upon her without preparation. Long paragraph. Long paragraph. Takes the whole page. Goodness. Preparation. The shower was heavy but short. And it had not been over five minutes when in came Harriet with just the heated, agitated look which hurrying thither with a full heart was likely to give. Likely to give. And the, oh, Miss Woodhouse, what do you think has happened? Which instantly burst forth, had all the evidence of corresponding per... 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 Likely to give. And the, oh, Miss Woodhouse, what do you think has happened? Which instantly burst forth, had all the evidence of corresponding perturbation. As the blow was given, Emma felt that she could not now show greater kindness than in listening. Than in listening. And Harriet, unchecked, ran eagerly through what she had to tell. She had to tell. She had set out from Mrs. Goddard's half an hour ago. She had been afraid it would rain. She had been afraid it would pour down every moment, but she thought she might get to Hartfield first. Hartfield first. She had hurried on as fast as possible. But then, as she was passing by the house where a young woman was making up a gown for her, she thought she would just step in and see how it went on. What went on? And though she did not seem to stay half a moment there, soon after she came out, it began to rain, and she did not know what to do. Know what to do? So she ran on directly as fast as she could and took shelter at Ford's. At Ford's. Ford's was the principal woolen draper, linen draper, and ha Haberth. At Ford's. Ford's was the principal woolen draper, linen draper, and haberdasher shop united, the shop first in size and fashion in the place. In the place. And so there she had set, without an idea of anything in the world, full ten minutes perhaps, when all of a sudden, who should come in? To be sure, it was so very odd. So very odd. But they always dealt at Ford's. Who should come in but Elizabeth Martin and her brother? And her brother. Dear Miss Woodhouse, only think, I thought I should have fainted. Should have fainted. I did not know what to do. I was sitting near the door. Elizabeth saw me directly, but he did not. He did not. He was busy with the umbrella. I am sure she saw me, but she looked away directly and took no notice, and they both went to quite the further end of the shop, and I kept sitting near the door. Near the door. Oh dear, I was so miserable. I am sure I must have been as white as my gown. I could not go away, you know, because of the rain. But I did so wish myself anywhere in the world but there. Oh, but there. Oh, dear Miss Woodhouse. Well, at last, I fancy, he looked round and saw... Mm, my stomach is making noises. Oh, but there. Oh, dear Miss Woodhouse. Well, at last, I fancy, he looked round and saw me, for instead of going on with her buyings, they began whispering to one another. One another. I am sure they were talking of me. And I could not help thinking that he was persuading her to speak to me. Do you think he was, Miss Woodhouse? Miss Woodhouse? For presently she came forward, came quite up to me and asked me how I did and seemed ready to shake hands if I would. As if I would. She did not do any of it in the same way that she used, and I could see that she was altered. Was altered. But however, I tr- She did a- Was altered. But however, she seemed to try to be friendly and we shook hands and stood talking some time. Some time. But I know no more what I said. I was in such a tremble. Such a tremble. I remember she said she was sorry we never met now, which I thought almost too kind. It's too kind. Dear Miss Woodhouse, I was absolutely miserable. By that time, it was beginning to hold up, and I was determined that nothing should stop me from getting away. And then, only think. Only think. I found he was coming up towards me, too. 
slowly, you know, as if he did not quite know what to do. What to do. And so he came and spoke. And I answered, and I stood for a minute, feeling dreadfully, you know, one can't tell how. Tell how? And then I took courage, and said it did not rain, and I must go, and so off I sat. I sat. And I had not got three yards from the door when he came after me, only to say if I was going to Hartfield, he thought it much better I'd go round by Mr. Cole's stables. The stables? For I should find the near way quite floated by this rain. By this rain? Oh, dear, I thought it would have been the death of me. The death of me. So I said I was very much obliged to him. You know, I could not do less. And then he went back to Elizabeth, and I came round by the stables. The stables? I believe I did. But I hardly knew where I was or anything about it. And about it? Oh, Miss Woodhouse, I would rather done anything than have had it ha. Huh? And about it? Oh, Miss Woodhouse, I would rather done anything than have it happen. And yet... You know, there was a sort of satisfaction in seeing him behave so pleasantly and kindly. And kindly. And Elizabeth, too. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, do talk to me and make me comfortable again. Comfortable again. Very sincerely did Emma wish to do so, but it was not immediately in her power. In her power. She was obliged to stop and think. Stop and think. She was not thoroughly comfortable herself. Well, herself. The young man's conduct and her sister's seemed the result of real feeling, and she could not but pity them. But pity them. As Harriet described it, there had been an interesting mixture of wounded affection and genuine delicacy in their behavior. In their behavior. But she had believed them to be well-meaning, worthy people before, and what difference did this make in the evils of the connection? The connection. It was folly to be disturbed by it. Disturbed by it. Of course, he must be sorry to lose her. They must all be sorry. All be sorry. Ambition as well as love had probably been mortified. Mortified. They might all have hoped to rise by Harriet's acquaintance. And besides, what was the value of Harriet's description? So easily pleased. So little discerning. What signified her praise? Praise. She exerted herself and did try to make her comfortable by considering all that had passed as a mere trifle and quite unworthy of being dwelt on. And dwelt on. It might be distressing for the moment, said she. Said she. But you seem to have behaved your... Mm. Said she. But you seem to have behaved extremely well, and it is over, and may never, can never, as a first meeting occur again, and therefore you need not think about it. Think about it. Harriet said, very true, and she would not think about it, but she talked of it. Still, she could talk of nothing else. Nothing else. And Emma, at last, in order to put the Martins out of her head, was obliged to hurry on the news which she had meant to give with so much tender caution. Tender caution. Hardly knowing herself whether to rejoice or be angry, ashamed or only amused at such a state of mind in poor Harriet. Poor Harriet. Such a conclusion of Mr. Elton's importance with her with her. Mr. Elton's rights, however, gradually revived. They revived. Though she did not feel the first intelligence as she might have done the day before, or an hour before, its interest soon increased. Increased. And before their first conversation was over, she had talked herself into all the sensations of curiosity, wonder and regret, pain and pleasure. And pleasure. As to this fortunate Miss Hawkins, which could conduce to place the Martins under proper subordination in her fancy. Her fancy. Emma learned to be rather glad that there had been such a meeting. Such a meeting. It had been serviceable in deadening the first shock without retaining any influence to alarm. It's to alarm. As Harriet now lived, the Martins could not get at her without seeking her where hitherto they had wanted either the courage or the condescension to seek her. And to seek her. For since her refusal of the brother, the sisters never had been at Mrs. Goddard's, and a twelfth month might pass without their being thrown together again. Together again. With any necessity, or even any power of speech. That was a long chapter. Speech. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. All of the links for our show are in the show notes. Show notes. We are part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you ever wondered what inspired your favorite classic novelists to write their stories, their stories, 
what was happening in their lives or the world at the time. Check out Bite at a Time books behind the story. Tuesdays, wherever you listen to podcasts. Podcasts. Again, my name is Bree Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow while we take the next bite of Emma. We'll see how long this next chapter is. I might be doing one more. I might be doing two more. We'll see.